Hello everyone, welcome back to the gates of Huldah. So we can see that it's still wild out there with all of the protests. And some are starting to ask about a leader for this movement because there is an absence of organized leadership. But as people of the Most High, people of the book, our declaration should be where they lead, we will not follow. If they are not leading us in the path of truth and righteousness, there are things we need to know about our leaders. We need to know what the leader believes. We need to know their philosophy and their mindset. We need to know the destination. Where are they trying to lead us to? I want to know where we're going to end up at the end of this journey. So what I'm saying is we need to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors. If you remember when Israel came out of Egypt, only two of the original people were allowed to go into the promised land. That was Joshua and Caleb. The rest wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So we need to examine what happened before they got into the land and then what happened when they got into the land. Because Israel made a serious mistake when they got into that land. And that mistake has led to our condition today. We'll address those things in today's session, but let's read the scripture from Isaiah 9, 16. For the leaders of this people caused them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. So we see two things. The leaders led the people into error, and as a result, it led to their destruction. We can't make that mistake again. Because Israel, they were given specific instructions before they even got into that land before they got there so we need to know what were those instructions we need to know what were they told so that we can ensure that we're not following after leadership that's going to lead us on a path of destruction some questions we need to be asking the leader what is your message where did you get it from and again, where are we going to end up at the end of this journey? So I want to start here with 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 5. It says, Now it came to pass when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So we see that Israel is asking for a leader. They're asking for a king. So after I read this, I asked, what happened? What caused the people to ask for a king? The Most High didn't want them to have a king. He permitted it because the people agreed as one that they wanted a king. But what led to this request? We see that the sons of Samuel were wicked. They were taking bribes and perverting justice. So then my next question was, well, how could Samuel's sons turn out that way? Samuel had a heart to do what was right. What happened? Then I remember that Samuel didn't grow up in the house of his natural father. His mother, Hannah, gave him to the Lord when he was a young child. So the only father figure he had was Eli. And if you remember the story of Eli, his sons were killed because they were wicked and he would not correct them. So Eli was Samuel's role model for fatherhood. If we were to stop there, we would think that it was just bad parenting that caused the sons of these two prophets to go astray. Until you dig deeper. Let's keep going. So we know in 1 Samuel 8, and we're reading uh, 18, through 20, that Samuel was very upset when the people asked for a king. And the Most High told them, tell them everything that's going to happen, you know, if they appoint a king or uh, get a king. 
And he told them exactly what the Most High had said to him. And in verse 18, he says, You will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourself. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So, we see that they came into agreement, which is why the Most High, Most High allowed it. They came into agreement saying that they would have a king. And then they said they wanted to be like all the nations. That is something we definitely have to stop doing, trying to imitate what other nations are doing. The Most High's plan for us is not going to be like what all the other nations are doing. His thoughts are not, not like our thoughts. His ways are not like our ways. All right, so then they said they wanted a king to judge them. Well, we're going to read a scripture in a few minutes where the Most High had already put a plan in place for that. And then they said, we want this king to go out before us and fight our battles. So there were uh, enemies coming up and attacking them, and they were afraid. So they wanted a king who would go out and fight for them. But what caused this to happen? They were in the land of promise. Why should they have been afraid? Let's keep going. So let's look at this in Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 19. It says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall sh not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. So we see here that the Most High had already given them a strategy, a plan. They were supposed to appoint judges and officers. And those judges were supposed to judge with just judgment. They were not supposed to pervert justice, show partiality, or take bribes. But we see that Samuel's sons had done exactly that. His sons were taking bribes and they were perverting justice. So how in the world did they get to this place? Let's keep going. This is the answer right here, you all. Psalms 106, 34 through 35. It says, They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. Well, who were those people that they were supposed to destroy? Let's take a look at that. So the answer is here in these scriptures in Joshua 13, 8 through 13. It says, With the other half tribe, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses had given them beyond the Jordan eastward as Moses the servant of the Lord had given them from a rower which is on the bank of the river Arnon and the town that is in the midst of the ravine and all the plain of Medeba as far as Dibon all the cities of Sion king of the Amorites who reigned in Heshbon as far as the border of the children of Ammon Gilead and the border of the Geshurites and the Maacathites, all Mount Hermon and all Bashan as far as Salca, all the kingdom of Og in Bashan. And we know that was one of the giants who reigned in Ashtaroth and Idrii. It says, who remained of the remnant of the giants. For Moses had defeated and cast out these. Nevertheless, 
the children of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Maacathites, but the, the Geshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the Israelites today. Now I'm going to read to you so that you can see what happened as a result of that. All right, Joshua 23, 11 through 13. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God or else. If indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them and go into them and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And that is exactly what happened. All because they refused to drive out these people and destroy them like they were told. So we see two things right here. Disobedience and bad leadership. So what should we be doing right now? What should we learn? Of course, our message has to be preparation for the return to our land. That's the end game for us. Nothing short of that. And then we need to prepare ourselves to rule. We need to prepare our children to face what's coming. But we also need to make sure that we do not align ourselves with everybody. We need to know who they are. What's their message? Is it a doctrine? that lines up with scripture or are they going to be leading us astray that's what got us into our predicament the first time you all we have to get this lesson we have to get this lesson we have to be careful to obey <laughs> obey and we can't just follow after bad leadership. All right, so this particular group here um, is getting a lot of attention right now and they have been at the forefront of everything going on with the protests, etc. I am going to refer to them as BLM because many of you know who watch this video when I uploaded it on yesterday that it was taken down twice. Um, I appealed it and got an email saying that they couldn't find anything wrong but then it was taken down again. So this is the only content that I could think of that could be um, against the policies. I have no idea why. Uh, there is nothing hateful that was said about this group or others. However, um, I would encourage you to go to their website and read what they believe um, because they have their history and why they started out and we can see that it started out with some good ideas for some good reasons. Um, so they wanted to create a world free of anti-blackness uh, where every black person has the social, economic, and political power to thrive. So what I said on yesterday is I, I couldn't see anything wrong with that. But then as you continue to read, so let's go to the next section. All right, so you'll have to scroll down uh, near the midsection of the page. There's a lot there to go through, uh, but just to make sure you understand uh, everything that they believe in, what they are fighting for. And I took note of this sec section that says we are self-reflexive and do the work we required to dismantle cisgender privilege. So what that means is 
uh, trying to do away with labels uh, based on, you know, what was said about you when you're, you were born, what identity, you know, was given to you when you were born. So they are trying to dismantle this. They said this is a privilege. So as you read through the rest of this, um, you see things like we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages. And then they talk about the networks that they are affirming. So as a believer, as uh, people of the book, this is information that you want to know. You need to know, is am I in agreement with these ideas, these beliefs, these philosophies? Because if there are folks who are saying or being pushed to the forefront uh, of the movement, then you definitely need to know, are we in alignment? Are we in agreement? Let's keep going. I also shared this article with you. You may want to look this up on your own. It's talking about how pride festivals are becoming Black Lives Matter protests. And just a snippet of this, it says, um, for many pride festivals this year already presented a shift in priorities Overall, as corporate diversity funding was pulled back during the pandemic, leaving organizers to rethink the purpose of their events. And then it goes on to talk about some of the companies who were major supporters of the events like T-Mobile, MasterCard, uh, Hyatt, Omnicom, United Airlines, and Target. And then some of the uh, trout, some in the travel industry, but they had to pull back, um, you know, the amount of their support due to everything that's going on with the pandemic. So uh, the group says that, you know, they were hit hard because these companies had to pull back um, because um, their bottom line had been affected by COVID-19. Let's keep going. This is another group, uh, Pace and Adrian Critcher. She's the political and communications director for them. Uh, she said they wanted to come out and protest in honor of George Floyd to condemn the actions of the Minneapolis police officers associated with his death. But we wanna make it real clear that we are primarily advocating for LGBTQ issues. All right, let's keep going. So although, you know, we know why people are coming together to protest, and unfortunately some of them are rioting, when we see groups step to the forefront um, saying that they are representing us or may not be saying it, but it is perceived that they are representing us as a people. We need to know what they believe. We need to know whether or not we're in agreement with that. We can't get caught up in numbers. If you remember Gideon, the Most High gave him the victory with 300 men. And the Most High is not going to fight for us if he is not getting the glory. His plan is for the nations of the world to recognize him as the one fighting for his people and for them to acknowledge that he is the one true God. So we will fail if we try to join ourselves to groups that are promoting the ways of a system that's not in alignment with his kingdom, his principles. Yes, certainly there comes a time when we ha will have to stand up and defend ourselves and defend our families, etc. I am all for that. But before we lock arms with various groups, we need to know their agenda. People have the right to be what they want, but I can't be in agreement with someone when they're trying to dismantle 
precepts that the Most High put in place. I cannot knowingly follow those who promote an agenda that is in direct opposition to truth. Again, how can two walk together except they be agreed? So is our desired end the same? Let's take a look at this scripture, Joshua 23, 10. It says, one man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. So we need a determination to submit to our father and ask for his strategy through all of this. Let's learn the lesson that our forefathers failed to learn the first time. If you remember, a mixed multitude came out of Egypt. Think about this. Some of them didn't have the experiences that Israel had because slavery meant nothing to them. They were not enslaved. So for us, this is life or death. We need to make sure our message is sure and that we have the most high fighting for us. We can't win this fight apart from him. And if people are trying to speak for us and promote, and they're promoting an agenda that's inconsistent with holiness, like the leaders I talked about during the days of Samuel, we need to speak up and say, where you lead, I will not follow. We're in a fight. This is a spiritual battle for the souls of the people of Yah. You see what we're coming up against just to be able to speak the truth. So I encourage you to share this message with as many people as possible because this present darkness is trying to snuff out the light. But we know that our Redeemer lives and he is soon to return. Shalom, everyone.